and they came in and with vengeance on their mind. And uh, they massacred all of the relatives there. Some of them got away. Some of them were able to run for the ravines. It was, you know, terrible. Uh, my grandmother said that it was terrible where she ran and through the Hotchkiss guns being fired simultaneously created a, a gunpowder of smoke. You could hardly see. And she saw relatives of hers being shot dead. She saw children as young as infants to 10 years old being shot. On December 29, 1890, the U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry gunned down 300 unarmed people from the Lakota Sioux Nation. More than two-thirds were women and children. 20 of the U.S. soldiers involved in the killings were awarded Medals of Honor. Known today as the Wounded Knee Massacre, it remains one of the single worst atrocities committed against indigenous people in this country's history. But the crime against those murdered at Wounded Knee did not end that day. Hundreds of artifacts were stolen from the bodies of the victims and have been on display in a remote museum in the small town of Barrie, Massachusetts. Thousands of miles away from the site in what is known today as South Dakota. The museum's collection of items includes not only clothing and ceremonial pieces, but also human remains. Since the 1970s, Descendants of the victims and survivors have been appealing to the board of the museum to return the sacred artifacts, but the board has refused with no explanation. Chief Henry Red Cloud, the great-great-grandson of Chief Red Cloud, one of the most revered Lakota leaders, is one of the leading advocates to retrieve them. He's been working with activist Mia Faroletto to pressure the museum. I spoke to Mia and Chief Red Cloud about the fight for the return of these artifacts and how it relates to the bigger indigenous struggle for justice. The widely publicized and published story is that the grave diggers took them off the bodies of the massacred uh, people at Wounded Knee, dug a separate hole, hid them until things come down in the area and then went circled back and dug them up and um, sold them to a man named Frank Root. But the strange thing, you know, for, for me walking into this room, this room is long and narrow and, and literally mimics the mass grave at Wounded Knee. The shades are drawn. It's completely dark. I had to use a flashlight, as did Henry, um, to, to see the collection. And uh, there, you know, there's, there's no climate control. So these priceless treasures are sitting there uh, not being taken care of properly. In fact, we have no way of knowing the actual, the actual and true number of artifacts that, that was in the collection at the time that it arrived at the library slash museum. Um, I would not be surprised at all if some of these valuable items have you know, gone into private hands uh, and disappeared. But what is there is uh, truly, when I walked in, I was shocked. What, it, what is in there is, is, is so disrespectful. There's a, there's a case of taxidermy. So you've got all these stuffed birds in with multiple cases of Native American artifacts and remains. It is horrific to see uh, the scalps hanging there. Henry, talk about the significance of these artifacts. This is really horrific to hear um, that they have actual human remains there on display. We saw what looked like a hair lock, and then we saw turtles and uh, lizards. These turtles and lizards from the day that you're born, when your umbilical cord then falls off, then it's followed by ceremony, and depending on male or female, the female's umbilical cord is put in a turtle, as well as the lizard for the male. We saw several there. 
uh, we saw some cer ceremonial objects there, and we saw what looked like maybe 12 pipes there, ceremonial pipes there. When I went into the room, I felt so, I was so sad. I was saddened to see these there. According to our culture and our ceremony ways, when a person makes their journey, then uh, there's a, what you call a spirit releasing ceremony that, that needs to happen. You know, that, that never happened. And so the spirits are out here instead of making their journey to the greater mystery in the, in the stars. Right before they got access to view the collection, they were given surprising news. The museum board said the artifacts would be returned. However, this is only after each item is evaluated, evaluated by the museum board itself, and they offered no timeline or plan. There is a process for this outlined under federal repatriation law, but according to the chief executive of the Association of American Indian Affairs, the institution does not provide annual or financial reports and hoards its collection privately for the very reason to thwart federal law and the human rights of native nations. With the museum board disputing that most of the artifacts deserve to be returned, they are the sole decision makers. A month after their pledge, there has been no word from the museum. As of now, their promise to return the items ended as soon as the media coverage did. And I'm glad that we had so much media around it, just like saying earlier, they were afraid of the media. It had the real story brought out. What really happened? The real story, of course, is much larger than the one-room museum in Barrie, Massachusetts. It's the story of the United States, the story of a genocidal project built on stolen native land by massacre after massacre of native people. By the time of Wounded Knee, there had already been a war against the native peoples for 300 years. Generation after generation either heroically fought for survival or fought to make peace. But the tidal wave of settler colonialism overwhelmed it all. With the surrender of resistance leader Geronimo in 1886, the colonizing army had all but won, subjecting tribes to a military occupation trapped on reservations. In 1889, the Ghost Dance Prophecy was born, popularized by a spiritual leader named Wavanka, who had a vision that settler colonialism would be eliminated from the earth. He encouraged his followers to perform a ceremonial ghost dance to manifest this idea. When practiced, the dance invoked a vision of great loss and future hope. In his book, Our History is the Future, Lakota scholar Nick Estes explains, the visions were not escapist, but rather part of a growing anti-colonial theory and movement. Participants were transported to a forthcoming world where the old ways and dead relatives lived. It was a utopian dream that briefly suspended the nightmare of the wretched present by folding the remembered experience of a pre-colonial freedom into an anti-colonial future. The ghost dance spread across indigenous communities west of the Mississippi River in the late 19th century. Even though it was a non-violent practice, the U.S. government sought to violently suppress the movement with the largest contingent of soldiers since the Civil War. Their first target was Sitting Bull, a medicine man of the greater Sioux Nation and a powerful resistance leader. On December 15, 1890, he was dragged out of his home and executed for his role in spreading the ghost dance. Following his assassination, arrest warrants were issued for other ghost dance leaders including Chief Spotted Elk. Soon news got out that all of the ghost dancers would be hunted down. The tribal leaders and their followers tried to escape, but they were ultimately surrounded by soldiers at Wounded Knee Creek in Pine Ridge. The federal government was strong arming to stop all ceremonies, which they did. They did that time. They stopped all ceremonies. We were, we were for forbidden to practice our ceremonies, our song, our dance. So it was reaching out to the greater power, saying a prayer. You know, people were starving, people were hungry, 
people were freezing to death. Uh, and that old way of life, nomadic old way of life of hunting the buffalo and following and, and shelter, food and, and uh, clothing, one came to a stop then. It was totally, you know, different reservations. Everybody was, you know, confined. If you try to leave, then the cavalry would, you know, shoot you dead. So it was, you know, basically uh, at that time, as well as today, we're, uh, we're a concentration camp. Here in, on the Pine Ridge, we're known as Concentration Camp 334. So we're prisoners of war here since that time. It was a crime of conquest. After General Custer's expedition discovered gold in the Black Hills in the 1870s, a wave of settlers flooded into the region. The U.S. Army was deployed to crush the indigenous resistance. However, Henry Red Cloud's ancestors defeated the U.S. Army, and General Custer was ultimately killed. But defeat wasn't an option for the colonial authorities. Custer's death in 1876, while a spectacular military victory for the tribes who fought, did not change much. The U.S. government continued to seize more and more Lakota land, sending them to the reservation, which were under the gun of federal troops. Dependent on government rations and banned from hunting, they were on the verge of total starvation. When the ghost dance emerged out of this despair, the white settlers were outraged. And they came in and with vengeance on their mind. And uh, they massacred all of the relatives there. Some of them got away. Some of them were able to run for the ravines. It was, you know, terrible. Uh, my grandmother said that it was terrible where she ran and through the Hotchkiss guns being fired simultaneously created a, a gunpowder of smoke you could hardly see. And running through and trying to find her way, she was, you know, pregnant at the time when she ran. And she saw relatives of hers being shot dead. She saw children as young as infants to 10 years old being shot. She saw one instance where <coughs> soldiers went and grabbed a, a baby. They shot the mother and the baby was crying there. So they picked up the baby and threw him, threw him or her in the air and shot her there. Uh, she said it was so terrible, horrific. She was scared. She had all this trauma since, since that time. She survived and ran for the ravine. The Oglala Lakotas, one of the bands of the Greater Sioux Nation, which was the Pine Ridge Agency, brought her in and hit her at that time, changed her name to Run for the Ravine. Three months later, she had a son. And uh, so she came in within the Oglalas and she met my grandpa by the name of Kill's Enemy. Uh, she had these horrific stories to tell us. And uh, she was always afraid for her life. They didn't want anybody to know that she was a survivor at that time. Because they, in their mind, seeing what she saw running for the ravine, while well, everybody thought that the survivors were going to be hunted and slayed, you know, wherever they were, they were going to be killed. So, On the official U.S. Army flag, still flown today, there are 14 battle streamers spanning a century of military campaigns in the so-called Indian Wars. The final one awarded marks the Wounded Knee Massacre. In a way, it was a final blow. After 300 years of war, Wounded Knee marked the beginning of the end. The centuries of warfare had mostly been swept up by the overwhelming force of the technologically superior army. After Wounded Knee, only a few small skirmishes kept the armed resistance alive until they were all washed away. The treaties signed with the surrendering tribes by the U.S. government remained broken. Reservation life remained the most destitute places in the country. The process of genocide continued by erasing native culture and the program of infamous boarding schools, which kidnapped native children and sent them to be civilized through abuse. Even the artifacts of a life past 
are imprisoned in museums across the country. But let's talk about the broader issue and what this symbolizes, because, you know, for me, um, growing up in, in a country that is a settler colony, right? Settler colonialism founded on the, the genocide of native peoples. I can't even remember a time that I was at a museum in this country that told me the truth about what happened here. Um, not to mention the fact that there are museums all over that when you go there and do see artifacts like this, you kind of assume that this is a transactional thing, that this is done with respect to the, the distinct cultures that they're representing, that it's not based on exploitation and theft. And that's very alarming to me. I don't know how prevalent this is. You know, how big of a scale is this issue in this country that there are artifacts that are essentially stolen and not returned to Native peoples and justice has never been held? There are massive collections of artifacts and human remains. Uh, the biggest one has been 40,000 objects that a man named Don Miller was collecting and holding in his home in Indiana. He was in his 90s and there were um, 5,000 Native American artifacts and 2,000 2, uh, remains uh, making up uh, 500, 500 bodies. And there are institutions all over the country holding objects like this. They were just holding on to these things. Um, and you have to question, was it for financial reasons? You know, what, what is happening here? It's time to demand human rights, real human rights, not some lip service like what's gone on with Native Americans, you know, for hundreds of years now and, and bring them uh, some peace and, and, uh, and hope, um, you know, you talk about the wounded knee grave site that, that wounded knee and the bordering town of Manderson have the highest crime rates on Pine Ridge. You know, the daily, the Lakota are dealing with one crisis after another, as you know, you spent time there, you know, with your extraordinary coverage several years ago, the suicide rates, the 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 illness, the the crime. People have no idea what is happening in America, and the fact that Pine Ridge, along with Haiti, are the poorest places in our hemisphere. It's not acceptable that people can live without running water or toilets and dirt floors in their trailers, which are falling apart. Uh, in a country as wealthy as ours, and people have an income of, you know, appro approximately $5,000 a year. And it's time for us to acknowledge what we collectively have allowed to happen here. <laughs>